Different opinions and beliefs. They can foster creative ideas and discussions. They can also create tension, fighting, even violence. Tonight, the agenda will take a look at how these differences play out in science and religion. First, Bill Nye, the science guy, and why he has made it his mission to debunk creationism. Then, mistrusting science isn't just a right-wing game anymore. We'll look at why anti-science beliefs are growing on the left as well. Finally, does a difference in religion and religious beliefs always lead to violence? We'll explore all of that tonight on The Agenda. Funding for The Agenda with Steve Pagan is provided by Ontario's more than 80,000 chartered professional accountants. Public policy leaders since 1879. More information is available at cpaontario.ca. And by contributions to TVO by viewers like you. Thank you. You probably know Bill Nye best as TV's science guy. But over the last few years, he's turned his attention to debunking ideas of creationism. I spoke with him last season, and as part of our continuing look back at 10 years of the agenda, here is some of that conversation. How appropriate do you think it is to teach creationism to children? Uh, it's completely inappropriate in science class. Now, if you want to teach it in the history of religion or uh, uh, fascinating human undertakings, uh, uh, creation myths that turned out not to be true, 101, then that's uh, fine. But it's not, it's not science. It's not, it's nothing to do with uh, the way we know nature. Well, let me ask the obvious follow-up, and that is, what's the harm? Oh, then you raise a generation of kids, you have the potential for raising a generation of kids, and doesn't understand how we have everything that we have, how we have food, how we have electronics that allow us to have this uh, video conversation through the internet across a continent. It's, uh, none of this would be possible without the, the discoveries that were made through the process of science. When you try to embrace the ideas of creationists, as I understand it, who insist, apparently, that the Earth is six or somehow 10,000 years old, that's completely inconsistent with the scientific method and everything that we know. And so uh, you just don't want to have kids growing up with this conflict, this worldview of that's, that's wrong. You once said in another interview that, uh, quote, we're raising a generation of students that can't think at a time when we need them more than ever. So uh, tell us, how would teaching creationism stunt their growth or prevent them from thinking more than ever? So. Here's what you want in science. Here's what you want as a human, whether or not you're a scientist or, or whatever you do. You want to find, you want to discover the laws of nature that are true everywhere throughout the universe. And the examples that are easy enough are gravity, molecules, you know, chemistry, uh, then the fundamentals of life science. Now, in, the, in life in biology, this, the biggest idea, the main idea in all of biology is evolution. So by not teaching that fundamental idea in the, perhaps you could, certainly biologists claim it's the most important aspect of science. You're trying to raise people who have a worldview that's inconsistent with everything they observe. In other words, why would why would we be able to use radioactivity to generate electric power if there's no such thing as radioactivity to be discovered in rocks that indicate the age of the Earth? Why, how would that be possible? How would you have light from stars that are clearly more than 6,000 light years away if all of the, the stars and everything in between was created 6,000 years ago? It's, it's completely inconsistent with nature. Well, I hear what you're saying, but uh, uh, humor me for a second here. Here in the province of Ontario, we do have two fully publicly funded school systems. We have a publicly funded secular system and a publicly funded Catholic school system, and that was part of the original deal that gave us our country since 1867. It's been in place ever since then. Sons what? of a common mother. <laughs> there you go. 
Uh, one wonders, though, why it would be harmful to those students to learn all of the things in science class that you're talking about, while at the same time, maybe five minutes at the end of science class, say, you do know, uh, boys and girls, it is part of your faith to believe in God, and here's what God tells us about that. Is that well, confusing Catholic, for kids? Catholic Church, Catholic Church is not the same as the creationists here in the United States in the Commonwealth of Kentucky. The Pope, uh, three weeks ago, a month ago, came out saying, you know, evolution's this great thing. It's completely consistent with our uh, church philosophy and what we believe in. And so, so that's the Catholic Church is, doesn't have this issue, at least as far as I can tell. These are extraordinary people uh, that we encounter here in the United States that deny everything that we observe in nature. The, the Pope and the Catholic Church, as I understand it, is not is separate from that. Okay, good. Well, you know, of course, the, the Catholic Church and science also have had their moments throughout history, although perhaps oh, yeah, not but, more laterally. But the Vatican has its own astronomer, for crying out loud. I okay. mean, the, and uh, so many scientific discoveries were made by Jesuit priests. I mean, I, uh, you can't, if I may, deny that. So <laughs> that's okay. all. The Catholic Church is, is not exceptional the way these creationists in the United States are. Okay, I understand the distinction. Here again, another quote from your book. Inherent in the rejection of evolution is the idea that your curiosity about the world is misplaced and your common sense is wrong. This attack on reason is an attack on all of us. What do you mean by it's an attack on all of us? In other words, every, everything that uh, the rest of us do as taxpayers and voters and citizens of the world, everything that we do... Uh, to improve the lives of other people or to improve our own quality of life, to build buildings that rely on our understanding of physics, to build sewer systems that rely on our understanding of gravity, that all of this is inconsistent with this other world view that uh, taken where they take the Bible literally, as written in English, by the way, take that literally and deny everything else that gives us all these wonderful things that our society provides, food, clothing, and shelter. So when you are attacking our science or our ancestors who made these discoveries about nature, you are, for me, attacking all of us who embrace it and use it and want to make the world better. So are you urging people to give up on the idea of creationism? Oh, yeah, please. Now, keep in mind that if you're a grown-up, if you're an adult, and you've been raised with this creationist point of view, it's very, very difficult for you to let go of that. It's very, in the Mormon church, they call it losing your testimony. It's very, very difficult for that, but to let go of that. But for kids, uh, they grow up with this conflict. Everything they see in nature, all the cool video games they enjoy, the cars they ride around, and they're a result of science. And yet they, have, they will have grown-ups, adults, insisting that the, the fundamental way we learned all that is wrong. And uh, everybody else who embraces those fundamental things that we've discovered in nature is wrong and is something wrong with them. And it's the kids that concern me because when it comes to climate change, for example, we need all the brains we can get to address this problem. So if we raise a generation of science students that doesn't believe in science, well, it's a formula for disaster. Do you think this is a, an American phenomenon solely or does this go around the world? Well, it goes around the world. The guy, Ken Ham, here in the United States, was from Australia. And between you and me and all of your viewers, there's something going on in Canada that is odd to the rest of us. You know, if you look at satellite images of Alberta from space, about a quarter of the province has been denuded, has been leveled. Uh, destroyed, or the ecosystem been destroyed. About a third of the forest been destroyed in Alberta for the sake of getting this bitumen out. And I can understand it because it seemed like it would make a lot of money. But we have climate change now. It's the worst of both worlds. You're destroying the ecosystems that provide oxygen for everybody to breathe. By everybody, I mean living things on the surface. And then you're, uh, they, we are burning the oil, producing more carbon dioxide than we would any other way. And by the way, it's the, it's the most carbon dioxide intensive oil around. You got to burn up to 30% of it to get it melted enough so you can pump it. And so 
I know that, uh, rather, my sense as a guy in the United States who visits Canada quite often, I was there uh, three times this fall, uh, my sense is that the Canadian government is not entirely in touch with the wants of the Canadian people, especially when it comes to First Nations people. And so I, I'm hoping that as the price of, nat of, price of liquid petroleum, of gasoline and petrol, falls as a result of all the natural gas that's being mined, I hope everybody will rethink the efficacy or the real long-term effect of denuding uh, these enormous landscape, these enormous areas of Alberta for the sake of the short-term gain of oil. I was just about to say, at $40 a barrel, it becomes very uneconomical to try to yeah. get that oil out of the ground, yeah. so you may not have to worry about that much longer. I mean, everybody knows, the sodium price fluctuates, I got you, but mm -hmm. along this line, the people, at least here in the United States, the people who insist on creationism, the earth is 6,000 years old, also deny climate change. It's a big deal with them, with Ken Ham and those guys. Well, since you mentioned Ken Ham, let's play it. We've got some tape of him here. He, of course, runs this uh, creationist museum in Kentucky where you referenced earlier. Uh, you guys uh, actually had a bit of a moment. So let's play this tape, and then we'll come back and chat. Roll tape, please. <laughs> what keeps the United States ahead, what makes the United States a world leader, is our technology, our new ideas, our innovations. If we continue to eschew science, eschew the process, and try to divide uh, science into a observational science and historic science, we are not going to move forward. We will not embrace natural laws. We will not make discoveries. We will not uh, invent and innovate and stay ahead. Okay, so you went into the heart of the lion's den there to take him on on his home turf. And I wonder about this, though. You know, the United States is still you know, number one in post-secondary institutions, number one in patents, number one in scientific advances. It's, it's number one in so many of the big scientific categories. It's also number one in Jesus, right? It's number one in creationism. It's number one in people who believe that the Bible is the literal word of God. So it's translated into English in the 20th century. I mean, keep it, I don't know what it really said in Sanskrit or Hebrew or one of the earlier texts, you know. But I guess the point is, America seems to be doing okay, even though it's following both of these tracks, both science and creationism. No? Uh, yes and no. Okay. So in the top tier, well, you probably have heard of places like Harvard, uh, Berkeley, University of California, Berkeley, Stanford, Cornell. Uh, Where you went, yes. Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, Caltech, and those places, California Institute of Technology. Sure enough, the United States is producing top-level students, top-level graduates, Nobel laureates, and stuff like that. But in the middle grades, in most of the educational system in the U.S., we are falling, the United States is falling behind uh, because science education isn't as good as it could, or if I can use the term, should be. And so this is a deep concern. I mean, the top level is doing okay, okay, but the systems that feed the top level are not doing okay. And to have this enormous, I mean, this guy, the Creation Museum, as they call it, there's, by the way, it's not a museum the way you think of a museum. There are no artifacts there. There's nothing from the past there. They're all sort of dioramas or robotic displays. But that aside, uh, that organization, Answers in Genesis, gets millions and millions of dollars from someplace. And their supporters who generally deny uh, science, the process by which we have this technology we're using right now, and especially deny climate change at a time when we really can't afford to do that. Well, let me just make sure I understand that point. Are you saying you can draw a straight line between those who deny science, those who believe in creationism, and you just draw that line, and it leads you inevitably to being a climate science denier or a climate change denier? Well, the le yeah, the leaders of that organization certainly are that, those people. I mean, they say the Earth is cooling, which is wrong. <laughs> 2014 was the hottest year on record. And so, uh, they're, I mean, they're just obviously wrong. And this is where people in the progressive side are very frustrated. Uh, is so-called not, the term you'll hear a lot in the U.S. right now, hyphenated, is fact-based. <laughs> Their view of the world is not fact-based. 
it's sort of wishfully thinking based and uh, it's it's bad because of the future well it's, you, it's going to be affected you know I, I've got a guy who emails me all the time probably w once or twice a week uh, trying to make the case that uh, you know there's this grand conspiracy uh, to advance an agenda in favor of climate change when in his view it isn't really happening and when that story came out that you just pointed out that the uh, the last year was the hottest year on record he'll say well yeah we've kept records for 150 years the earth is four and a half billion years old um, has he got a point? No. Uh, two things. First of all, it's not just that the Earth was once warmer and there was once more carbon dioxide in the time of the ancient dinosaurs. There was warmer and there's a little more carbon dioxide. It's the speed. It's the rate at which the world is getting warmer. That is the concern. The rate at which things are changing. We will not be able to keep up if we stay on this trajectory. Then to his first point, a conspiracy theory is lazy. I'm sorry, sir, but you're, if only there were a small group of people in charge controlling things and messing things, that's not how it rolls, man. I'm sorry, it's just people everywhere. When I was a kid, there were three billion people in the world. I remember when it changed, it was big news. It changed from 2.9999999 to three billion people in the world. Now there's 7.2 billion people in my lifetime, it is more substantially more than doubled. And that's the problem. The atmosphere is extraordinarily thin when as viewed from space. And there's 7 billion people burning it and breathing it. And that's why we're changing the climate. I'm sorry, it's not a conspiracy. If only it were that simple. It's just that's kind of a lazy. I'm sorry, sir. There's just a lazy way of looking at the world. There is nobody in charge screwing things up. It's a bunch of people running around doing what they want. I will email him back and let him know that that's what you've <laughs> well, had to say about this. Probably, he probably watches broadcasts like this. That's <laughs> yes, what, indeed. He did sure what does. I could to speak to him directly. <laughs> All right. On the issue of, of, I get it, you don't want the schools teaching this stuff, or if they do it in religion class, that's one thing, yeah. but certainly not in science class. But I guess alongside that, do you also need parents to stop teaching this to their kids as well? Because obviously if you're from a religious family, presumably you're going to be hearing this at home as well as at school, yes? I just really want to, in general, it's not religion that's, that's uh, teaching creationism. It's a special subset of a certain religion that's te teaching creationism. I just really want to say it's not a broad brush on that. And so, yeah, the problem, our problem is when parents are brought up with this extraordinary worldview, they bring their kids up with these extraordinary worldviews, and it's really hard to change when you're a grown-up. I mean, it's harder than quitting smoking or what have you. And so uh, our trouble is for a society that needs as many scientifically literate people as possible, and I'm not talking about the United States, I'm talking about the world, Canada especially, uh, we need as many people who are literate who can make good decisions as voters about what's reasonable, what's a good thing to do, what's not a good thing to do, what we need to put our resources into, what we should not put our resources into. We need those people to understand science well enough to make good decisions. Hmm. And of course, we need engineers and scientists to change the world. <laughs> uh, we showed that clip earlier of you going into Kentucky, into Ken Ham's quote unquote museum to take him on. Any trepidation about doing that? You, you really did put yourself sort of in the middle of a potentially hostile crowd when you did that. If you stop being nervous, quit doing it. So, yeah, you absolutely are nervous. But what you try to do, what, this is what I'm talking about theater, or if you're on television, you try to take that nervousness and turn it into excitement. And I was very confident in my uh, facts, very confident in my ability to keep my cool. And so it was, I wanted to be in the lion's den. And sure enough, because of the remarkable resources that they have, and by that I mean money, they publicized this thing like crazy to the point where people in Ontario watched it. <laughs> Things had almost four million views. I mean, that's a, there's not that many webcasts of any kind that get four million views. I mean, you're getting up into the you know spacecraft landing on a comet kind of numbers, and so <laughs> it's a it's really a remarkable thing. It shows you how interested people around the world are in the nature of scientific discovery and this belief system, this creationism, and this sort of lack of understanding or, 
lack of uh, traditional teaching of evolution. Evolution is the main idea in biology, and we have a huge number of people around the world who aren't familiar with it. So I wrote this book. I'm a mechanical engineer, okay? I mean, I, I tell everybody I took a lot of physics. Well, what do you know about biology? Well, I know, I know enough. <laughs> I wrote a book uh, that's a primer, a primer, about some fundamental ideas we should all know about in evolution. And I say, when you realize that you're going to die, I'm the first to admit that, you know, that kind of sucks, if I may use the term. It's very troubling. But it's part of the process of life. And the process of life is described and a result of evolution. And so we all want to understand it. And uh, I think that's, I guess, that's why so many millions of people have taken such a deep interest in this. Mm -hmm. Now, you say, of course, that you answered his um, charges or, you know, his side of the argument with science, with facts. And, of course, he says the same thing. You know, he says, and his company's called Answers in Genesis, and they published, he had one of his companies publish a review of, um, of his side of the debate, which said the following. It said, Ken answered the harder questions with scripture, reason, and data, while Bill Nye often answered the hard questions with, it's a great mystery, or don't know. Uh, when, you're, you know when you're dealing with kids on these things, and you're trying to get kids to see your side of the argument, uh, who's got the easier case to make? Well, this is, to me, in the larger picture, science is the easier case to make because what you want in any scientific theory, and this is the traditional use, scientific use of the word theory, you want to be able to make predictions. You want to be able to, because of these facts, we can now tell you that this is going to happen. Well, in Ken Ham and those guys, in their worldview, they can make no predictions. They have what would be described as a just-so story. In other words, they create a thing that is self-consistent. Uh, in this case, a deity created not only the world that we know, but the entire universe in a moment, or seven days, and six days, I guess, and he took a day off at the end. Uh, and he created everything that you can see in that same moment, or those same moments, so that it's logically consistent, uh, but is not consistent when you, in, when you think about it, as we say, critically. Like, is that very reasonable? That stars were put there and light was put into space between us and the stars to fool us or to trick us or to make us think that it was all done at once. It's just not reasonable. And so uh, I use that term many times. So one of the remarkable things discovered in my lifetime, this is by way of example, uh, when I was uh, young, taking physics and so on, people were studying the universe, and the universe has been discovered to be expanding. This is the Big Bang, discovered by Edwin Hubble on about 1927. The universe is expanding. And people thought the universe then has enough gravity to slow down, and the universe would slow down. And would the universe stop and collapse again? Would the universe slow down, slow down, slow down forever and never stop slowing down? Well, it turns out the universe is accelerating. That was discovered and published in about 2004. And do you know why the universe is accelerating? Nobody knows why. <laughs> and so for us in science, that's wonderful and exciting and drives us forward. And we want to make discoveries. We want to build instruments to study the universe and find out why it's accelerating and learn more about our place in space, our place in the cosmos. But the creationists, as far as I can tell, don't want to do any of that. They want it to just be just so. They want to close the book and say, that settles it, I'm done. And they want to teach that to their kids so that they do not make the discoveries that will change the world. They do not learn about the cosmos, our place in space. They do not make the next scientific discovery that will enable us to create enough energy and produce enough food and potable water for the seven plus billions of people in the world. They just want to check out, tune out, not get involved. And that's very troubling for those of us who are trying to leave the world better than we found it. Hmm. I, I know I can speak on behalf of millions of kids who've never been able to tune out when you speak, Bill Nye, science guy, as you uh, did for so many years on TVO. Uh, thanks again for joining us uh, on Ontario's thanks. Public Broadcasters. Great to have you along again. Thanks again. Up next, why questioning science isn't just a right-wing game anymore, right after this.
vaccines cause autism. Wind energy is causing cancer. Right-wing wackos? Well, our next guest says these sentiments are alive and well on the left as well. Joining us now in Los Angeles, California, here's Michael Shermer. He's publisher of Skeptic Magazine and a columnist for Scientific American. Michael, it's good to welcome you to the program, and in doing so, I want to just start by reading an excerpt of something from a publication called Science Left Behind, written by Alex Barrazo and Hank Campbell, and it goes like this. By the modern era, super-rationalist progressives who once had held an almost religious belief in the power of science to create a utopian future had now largely left science behind. Lacking an emphasis on objective fact and focused primarily on legislating ideology and fighting anything that disagreed with cherished ideas, progressives became, as we know them today, unscientific, while claiming the mantle of modernity, denizens of a world where science is replaced by feel-good fallacies. Let's get into this. How exactly are progressives, or those on the left, unscientific in their ideology? Right. Well, um, first of all, I wrote that column based on that book in Scientific American, uh, largely because uh, for the past 10 years or so, I've been pounding run Republicans pretty, pretty hard on their anti-science attitudes, particularly uh, against the theory of evolution and, and global warming. Uh, and I got a lot of mail, you know, saying, hey, what about, you know, people on the other side? They can be anti-scientific. So people were sending me lots of examples. And when I saw this book, I thought, yeah, I should try to be a little fair here and, you know, dish it out to the other side as well, because nobody has a monopoly on truth and nobody's free of political bias for sure, including myself. So it's good to, I think, just sort of spread the skepticism around. And in, in particular, uh, I would agree with that sentiment you just read there from the book and uh, and just sort of look at the larger picture that like um, in, in that very issue of um, evolution, for example, there there are, of course, creationists on the one side, on the Republican side who don't believe in evolution at all. Um, and, but on the other side, there's what I call cognitive creationists, that is people who don't believe that evolution applies from the neck up. That is, they pretty much uh, think that the mind is a blank slate, almost entirely um, constructed by culture, by the environment. And, uh, and this is simply not true. These evolution wars about the mind have been fought out over the last 20 years. In fact, it was over uh, almost a century and a half since Darwin published The Origin of Species that it was actually acceptable to claim that the human brain evolved just like the rest of the human body and that the, and the brain as an organ is like any other organ in the body. It evolved for a particular purpose to solve problems in the ancestral environment. That was controversial all the way up until just recently. In fact, it's still kind of controversial. So that idea, the blank slate, I consider that to be largely an anti-science attitude. And that attitude is almost entirely uh, held by people on the left. Um, now, I want to make another important point that um, when people attack Republicans, really what they're attacking is people on the far right, because most Republicans accept most of science. It's the extremists on the right. And on the left, most people on the left accept most of science. So what we're mostly talking about here is the extreme left, left or what are uh, called progressives, roughly speaking. Uh, so I think it's good to identify that because, in fact, as I showed in my column, uh, you know, 41 percent of Democrats don't accept evolution. So and 19 percent almost this is a recent Gallup poll, 19 percent of Democrats um, don't accept global warming as real and caused by humans. That's almost one out of five. So if if liberals are the so-called people of the science book, you know, th those numbers are not especially encouraging. So I think it's, it's good to be fair to look at the political bias on both the left and the right. We have, fair enough, and we actually have a chart which emphasizes a little more about what you just said. And Control Room, let's uh, bring this up if we can. These are the views of, as you can see, we've broken them into four different groups. Members of the general public, Democrats, Republicans, and then the Tea Party, that extra special feature of American political life these days. And here are their reviews as reflected by the red and blue bars on climate change and evolution. And you can see members of the general public 69% believe the Earth is getting warmer, only 57% believing humans have evolved. 81% of Democrats say Earth is getting warmer, 64% say humans have evolved. 49% of Republicans, showing the skepticism on climate change here, believe the Earth is getting warmer, only 45% believe in evolution. And among Tea Party types, only 41% believe that the Earth is getting warmer, and 43% believe in evolution. 
uh, you see the source at the bottom of the graphic there. So I appreciate your, your desire to sort of be an equal opportunity um, chastiser, if you like, of those who... Skeptic. Are, uh, yeah, <laughs> skeptic. Okay, that's the better word to use, uh, picking up on the name of the magazine. But let's, let's use a couple of other examples if we can. We talked about vac vaccines causing autism off the top. We talked about wind farms causing cancer. These are some of the things we hear nowadays. Uh, give us some other examples of that fringe on the progressive left uh, whom you find to be as anti-science as that fringe on the far right, if you will. Right, like the following movements uh, are largely led by people on the left, or the far left, progressive, say, anti-vaccination, anti-fluoridation, anti-nuclear, anti-coal, anti-natural gas, anti-hydroelectric, anti-wind, and anti-GMOs, or genetically modified organisms. Now, again, not everybody on the left, just, again, these ex extreme left progressives who seem to have more interest in a political agenda that has to do more with you know, like returning the earth or returning humanity to a natural state of things in which you really have to deny a certain amount of science uh, showing that these things are actually not as bad as, as what people on the extreme left think they are. For example, the anti-vaccination uh, movement, uh, almost nobody on the right uh, championed that. That was almost entirely a, a, a far left uh, movement, the anti-fluoridation, uh, same thing. Uh, I almost, I've met almost no, I haven't met a single Republican who agrees with that. Uh, coal, of course coal is, is bad for the air, but what are our alternatives? Well, okay, so wind. Oh no, wind is bad because the blades kill birds. Okay, what about natural gas? Oh no, natural gas is bad because it also contributes in a smaller way than coal, but still to global warming. Well, what about hydroelectric dams? Oh no, those are bad because they mess up uh, rivers and lake ecosystems. That's true. Uh, and and what about nuclear? Well, because of the nuclear waste and so on. So the, the, the question is, it becomes, okay, if you could marshal data to show all those things are bad, well, then what are we supposed to do? Well, on the very far left, of course, the answer is we should have far less people. But um, and, and that actually is happening. But we're never going back to a globe of say 10 million people you know we have 7 billion we're not going back we may go back down to 6 or 5 billion by say 2150 or 2200 but we're never going back to 10 million where we can all live off the land and uh, and so forth and so uh, i find those attitudes i don't know what you want to call them anti-science or anti-progress or anti-human they're anti-something and they're almost always led by people on the far left so is part of the point you're trying to make today that it is the far right is getting a bit of a bad break from mainstream media because we tend to focus on, I want to be careful what word I use here, but you know, you hear this expression about the loony left all the time and then you know, whatever the equivalent is on the right. Do we have to make sure that we shed equal disdain for the far left as the far right? <laughs> I don't think we need to be disdainful on either side. I think it's important to pull back and take a bigger picture look at why people believe what they believe. I mean, this is what I do for a living. I, you know, I wrote a book called Why People Believe Weird Things. I mean, this is what I do. Why do people believe this or that? And, and they have reasons. Uh, and we have this sort of moralization gap between the people that agree with us, who we think are the good guys, the moral people, and the people that are on the other team, the other side, uh, the other tribe that we disagree with, and, and they are bad, they're evil. And uh, both sides do this. We all do this. And uh, it's hard not to do that. And so this is why I like, and I've cited many times, Jonathan Haidt's uh, research. I think you've had Jonathan on the show before mm -hmm. on uh, looking at the five moral foundations and how liberals and conservatives differ on to what extent they emphasize these five different moral dimensions. And it's not that the right is always left, or the right is always wrong, and the left is always right, or <laughs> sort of a funny way to put it, but um, it's that they emphasize different things. I mean, so um, the right tends to emphasize things like rule of law, you know, na nationalism, national pride, family, um, you know, group cohesiveness, you know, obedience to authority to a certain extent. Under certain conditions, those are all good things. Under other conditions, they may not be so good. It depends on the context. And the left emphasizes more these uh, moral values of the protection of individuals, the, the you know, harm care, that we take care of people that can't take care of themselves, we make sure people are not harmed, and so forth. Those are also good moral values that many people on the right embrace, but they often don't embrace them to the extent that they embrace those other moral values having to do with, say, group cohesiveness or the rule of law. And so again, there's this constant tension. And, 
in my latest book, The Believing Brain, I actually conclude that it's possible because of our human nature, in which we have all five of these moral dimensions, that we will always have something like a two-party system, or at least a cluster of a bunch of parties that cluster toward the left and the right, in which you have this sort of tension, uh, in which you have one, one side that wants change and to upset the apple cart of of social order and you want and the other side that wants to maintain the conservatives they want to conserve the social order and it could be that it's good to have both of those keeping each other in check so that neither side goes too far hmm. and uh, so you know our, our current politics that always seems so uh, bellicose and so just hostile and angry and in fact I'm now old enough to know that there's really nothing new in in the current battles that it was always nasty it's always been nasty like that it was like that in the 60s with uh, Johnson and Nixon it was like that in the 1860s with Lincoln and what he had to go through to pass um, you know the the uh, abolitionist uh, the the amendment to ban slavery, sorry. Uh, I mean, it's always been that way. Maybe it always will be that way because of our human nature. That was Michael Shermer, publisher of Skeptic Magazine from part of an interview back in 2011. Up next, does religion lead to violence? We'll tackle that question right after this. Conventional wisdom says that religion and religious difference beget violence. But author Karen Armstrong says that humans can perpetuate violence quite easily on their own without religion. And joining us now for more, here's Karen Armstrong, author of Fields of Blood, Religion and the History of Violence. And we welcome you, Karen Armstrong, back to Toronto. Thank you. Where you've been many, many times, I gather. Many times. We're happy to have you back. Let's start with an excerpt of the book and then we'll go from there. You write, as one who speaks on religion, I constantly hear how cruel and aggressive it has been, a view that eerily is expressed in the same way almost every time. Quote, religion has been the cause of all the major wars in history. I have heard this sentence recited like a mantra by American commentators and psychiatrists, London taxi drivers and Oxford academics. It is an odd remark. Why is it an odd remark? Well, as I go on to say in the book, uh, we all know very well that the two, first two world wars were not fought for religion. Um, we know that um, terrorist experts tell us that whatever the motivation for an atrocity, uh, terrorism is always inherently political, whatever its ideology. It's about changing power, grabbing power. Um, and so, um, my fear is that if we dump everything on religion and fail to look at some of the political elements involved in the troubles of our time, we're not looking rationally or in a holistic, serious way at our situation and therefore won't be able to solve it. If we, re as you do, read the Torah, the Bible, the Quran, there are stories of remarkable violence in those books, all committed in the name of God for misdeeds that, uh, for most people today, ought not to be punished, you know, with such harsh sentences, let's put it that way. If that violence is right in these holy texts, why shouldn't people see religion as the cause of this violence? Um, well, there's, uh, you have to understand the way that religious, these religious texts have been read in, throughout history. Um, and the early texts that you're talking about where you see most of the violence in the Hebrew scriptures uh, we're not even sure that they were written as religious texts at all in the very beginning. Um, and throughout the, it's interesting that when the rabbis made uh, the Bible, uh, made, made the Bible central to Jewish spirituality after the fall of the temple, making Judaism a religion of the book, they completely uh, reinterpreted these old biblical stories. They'd seen too much violence, uh, they, that Jerusalem had been destroyed in a po pointless war against the Romans. Uh, they'd seen uh, a hideous uh, upri Jewish uprising put down with horrible loss of life. And they make out that Joshua, who's depicted in the Bible as slaughtering uh, all the Canaanites, um, as a peaceful, loving scholar of Torah who never lifted up a sword. King David too, who boasted of his military exploits, they say the same thing. There's much more violence in the Bible, even in the New Testament, than there is in the Quran. 
Uh, in the Quran, the word jihad, which we hear so much about these days, mm -hmm. is, appears, the word jihad and its derivatives, it appears only 48 times in the Quran. And in only 10 of those instances does it apply unequivocally to warfare. Uh, the rest of the, the word jihad means struggle. And, sometime, and the, the, the rest of the time, they're saying it's a struggle to give food to people when you don't have much yourself. So politics has perverted some of these words and stories, you believe? Well, uh, before the modern period, religion and politics was in every single culture, including European culture, before about 1700, were so deeply intermingled that it was impossible to separate them. I, the image I use is was trying to set, take uh, politics or religion out of politics would be like trying to take the gin out of the cocktail. <laughs> it was, uh, they, the two were combined. Uh, our view of religion as, as a separate activity, something uh, that uh, is a personally private thing between you and your maker, uh, connected with a set of doctrines and a set of uh, beliefs, uh, is a completely unique creation. Um, no other culture has anything like it. If, okay, let's take, let, Let's take your thesis that World War I and World War II were not you know, overwhelmingly religious wars. They were wars between civilizations, isms, call them what there you will. Na national wars. National wars. Nationalism has been very violent. How about the Crusades? I mean, clearly yeah. holy wars. Y yes, but there was certainly, and I'm not saying that religion is not involved in this, but it, they're in, religion's always in that cocktail. Mm -hmm. Keep that metaphor in mind. Um, but th th there was a strong element of uh, politics in the Crusades as well. Pope was using the Crusades to advance the cause of Western uh, Catholicism into the, the East world of Eastern Orthodoxy, which didn't accept papal supremacy. And by the end of the Crusades, at least on the part of the Crusaders, uh, the wars were becoming more and more secular, uh, more and more politically and um, pragmatically driven than by religion. And by the end of the Crusades, by the time you get to the Sixth or Seventh Crusade, what happens in the Holy Land uh, where it is far less important than the political impact a crusade has had on <laughs> subjects at home. So our impression of the Crusades over all these years, you believe, may be off. Well, a lot of people just see uh, on television some brave crusader with a sword, and that's as far as they know about the Crusades. Scholarship has always been aware of, of the political element. I want to know if there's anything in this book that you would reconsider, given that I think, I think you published this book before ISIS really came to mm -hmm. prominence. So is there anything that's happening in the Middle East on that front that has made you change your thoughts about this? Yeah, I've just um, written a, 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 an afterword, a new postscript for the paperback edition. Okay. And I deal with ISIS and I deal with, the de de with Paris. Now here with ISIS, you have uh, exactly what I've been talking about. Uh, you have uh, everyone, uh, perhaps not here in Canada, but certainly in the US, saying in ISIS we see the face of Islam. That this is entirely religiously orchestrated. In fact, uh, the, a lot of the ethos of IS is secularist. The core leaders of ISIS or IS uh, were members of Saddam's army, disbanded army, secular Baathists. Uh, it's why the ISIS has been so good on the battlefield. They have these expert warriors. I should push back a little bit on this part because th th that's going to come as news to a lot of people. That it there's is somehow this I secularist wish this angle. Get, in I wish ISIS. this could get out. Uh, a French hostage who was held for ten months um, by ISIS. Uh, was, and was released, said that the discourse of his captors was, ex was very secular, that when the, the hostages asked for a Quran, they didn't have one handy. Um, that is unusual. And uh, similarly, the, uh, uh, a, an ed a journalist from Foreign Policy magazine who interviewed fifth, uh, a whole group of IS supporters in Jordan said that they never raised the topic of religion so and, ISIS... and, 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 and when the call for prayer came, and now believe me, in Amman, uh, you can't not hear the call for prayer. It's deafening. Um, no one got up to pray. Uh, but there are, there are people with religious elements. Too. It's that cocktail again that mm. I mentioned. To, and you, when these young kids, too, who are going from places like the UK uh, to join the jihad, 
um, throughout a lot of their motivation um, is is not necessarily religious. Uh, many of, two of the uh, wannabe jihadis who left Britain last year to go to Syria had ordered Islam for dummies uh, from Amazon. <laughs> uh, while the other had ordered the Quran for dummies. It shows uh, that they were trying to get into the swing of things, but that, that they didn't really have much conviction. Forensic psychiatrists who've interviewed, uh, what, and these are not liberal softies like me, uh, these are former CIA officers uh, who've interviewed people in Guantanamo um, and uh, interviewed two people surviving lone wolf attacks, like Richard Reed, the shoe bomber, have found that um, only 20% of them have had a regular Muslim upbringing. Hmm. Uh, the rest are either self-taught, like those reading Islam for Dummies, uh, or they are um, new converts who don't know much about religion. And often they only start reading the Quran seriously when they get into prison. Well, I know you're not a huge fan of Ayan Hirsi Ali. Having said that, she was in that chair not too long ago, and she had something to say that relates to what we're talking about right now. So with your indulgence, we're going to play sure. this clip, and then we'll come back and chat, okay? Let's roll the clip, please. If you are raised a Muslim, you are taught to believe that the Quran is the true word of God and that you should obey every word in it, even if you've never read it, and that the Prophet Muhammad is the perfect moral human being and was and should be emulated. He understands that. He also understands that if you're raised in a Muslim home, there's a lot of talk of life after death, and he invests in that. He uses these three uh, very general aspects of Islam to draw in young, impressionable minds who are seeking a purpose, who are driven by conviction, and who want to do something moral and something big that transcends themselves. And he appeals to them by saying simply, if you are a true Muslim, then this is what you should be doing. The he in that case, of course, being the head of ISIS. Yes. Does, does the belief in life after death make religious people more likely to want to go to war? Um, I don't know. Um, I think... Uh, not all religious people believe in the afterlife. Muslims, Jews, and Chris Christians and Muslims do. Uh, they're rather unique in this. But so certainly, I think that that could be that could be a factor. Uh, but uh, more, I think, a factor is a sense of meaninglessness. That's what these forensic psychiatrists said, who actually interviewed and spoke to people who committed these atrocities. A sense of great futility. And I was speaking uh, last year to uh, one of our leading uh, military psychologists and, and philosophers in Britain. And he said the chief cause that has driven young men to the battlefield for, oh, throughout history has been boredom. Boredom, yes. Well, certainly yes. Canada and of World War I, we've had lots of stories about that. All of us. Um, mm. And, you know, people sometimes say to me, look, these young people going to um, Syria, They've got wives, they've got children, they've got jobs. And I say, precisely. Um, some of us are lucky to have wonderful jobs. Some people are in dead-end jobs. In dead-end marriages with dead kids end they marriage, don't love. And it's going on and on and on. Well, and would you concede this, though? If, if religion doesn't cause war, would you concede that religion can be a pretty good motivator for some to want to go to war? Yes, but so can nationalism. Now, uh, nationalism is a kind of religion. It fills, a, it, indeed, it was felt so after the French Revolution. It was felt so by a, a people like Fichte, the philosopher in the 18th century, that it was in the nation that we would find immortality now uh, and eternity, not, not in religion. Um, but uh, nationalism has been very violent in its, in its history. It fills us with one, you know, our hearts throb when the national anthem goes, people put their hands on their heart, they feel they belong to something oh, greater. Just watch the Olympics. But very early in the history of nationalism, Lord Acton pointed out, the historic British historian, that the emphasis in the nation on ethnicity, culture and language uh, would make minorities that don't fit the national profile extremely vulnerable. In some cases, he said, with horrible prescience, uh, you have, you can have, uh, they can be enslaved or they can even be exterminated. Hmm. Now, some of the worst atrocities of the 20th century, I'm thinking of the Nazi Holocaust, I'm thinking of the massacre of the Armenians by the young atheistic, young Turks, to create a purely Turkic nation. 
has shown uh, that there is uh, that that violence that uh, violence that uh, orchestrated by national feeling which makes our hearts swell mm -hmm. and if you think now that um, it's now no longer respectable to die for your religion but it is admirable to die for your country if you think of the sacred as something for which you you're prepared to die perhaps the nation has replaced God I don't know if you remember James Fallow's review of your book in the New York Times. I never read them. You never read reviews? No. Well, then this will come as news to you. Let me read this excerpt to you. So convincing is Armstrong's overall case that I wish she had not tried to make it airtight. Even in episodes that would seem to have some religious element, she is at pains to say that the origins must be seen as wholly political. If the Taliban or Islamic State marauders cite their faith as justification for their killing, that is, Armstrong says, a sign not that they've spent too much time with the Quran, but too little, and have ignored the many passages exhorting mercy and tolerance. The argument comes right to the edge of tautology in suggesting that if a religion seems to provoke violence, then it's not properly a religion at all, but rather a manifestation of state power. You want to uh, take them on on that? Oh, well, I, I, I don't say that religion is not involved. I mean, that, it's, you come back to the cocktail again. Um, it's certainly an element there. It can certainly be abused. But uh, all I'm saying is don't forget the political. Hmm. In Paris, for example, uh, the stress was all on the supermarket. Uh, not on, on, on the, on the uh, magazine attack. This is the Charlie Hebdo. The Charlie Hebdo about. attack. And it was all about freedom, etc. Um, and these people who did it, did it out of pure, they think, uh, zealous, zealotry for their profit. Uh, but there was no, very little discussion of the supermarket, even though the hijacker there made it, said quite clearly that he was acting on behalf of the Palestinians. Hmm. And I think you've got always to look also for that political element, not wiping it out, um, and realizing that perhaps not Canada, but certainly my country, Britain, is very much in, has very much involved in Middle Eastern politics. We helped to create these problems in our colonial history. You drew the lines on the map a hundred years ago. And look, what the, and now ISIS is busy tearing them down. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the and ISIS is a result of the British and American-led uh, war in Iraq. Hmm. So um, we've got to look at these things too, and not just think that people rise up out of pure uh, hysterical piety alone. There are always factors, so other factors involved. Let's finish up on this thing, Karen. How, when we read these religious texts, there are certainly uh, calls to violence. Mm. There are calls to peaceful behavior as well. How do we know which passages we ought to consider supreme? Uh, religion, uh, we're reading our scriptures now with a literalism that has no parallel in uh, religious, the religious history of humanity. Mm. That's partly because of the literal character of our scientific uh, um, idea. We, we've lost the idea of myth and, um, and, and, and basically interpretation of the Bible. Uh, it's been well said that the Bible is not, scripture is not a text, it's an activity. And it's, an, it's a struggle, it's what the Muslims would call a jihad, to make sense of these texts. Yes, th there are violence in the, all these texts, not just the, 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 the monotheistic ones, because we are violent creatures. And they're, they're, they are violent, uh, we are not only, we're a violent species, and violence is, was essential to the creation of civilization. These are products of civilization, our scripture. So therefore, we, we confront the piebald nature of humanity that longs for peace, but is violent. We're a violent species, um, and are, especially the males of the species, addicted to war. And just finally, I, I hope you'll forgive this personal question, but how religious are you? Hard to say. I don't belong to any religious community at all. And yet, and I used to hate religion just as much as Ayan Hirshi Ali there. Um, and I wanted nothing to do with it ever again. But my study of the religious history of mankind or humanity uh, showed me things that were new that I could really relate to. I spend my days writing, thinking, and speaking about God, spirituality, meaning, nirvana, Tao. And in that, I find a great deal of wisdom and joy.
So, Weren't you a nun at one point? I was, but many, many decades ago. Um, <laughs> I was there for seven years as a young woman. Um, but if I hadn't done that, I wouldn't be here talking to you now. It's been a, 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 an up and down quest uh, with fits and starts. Uh, but it's fin finished me up um, as, as, as someone uh, who uh, loves the study of religion and what it's teaching is wisdom. It's the theme of compassion that we haven't spoken about at all, uh, we don't hear much about, has much to tell us today in our globalized world where we concentrate so much on the nation and on our personal cultures that we're unable, as the religions teach us, uh, to, to have concern for everybody. Uh, for we have need to do that, those teachings of universalism that we find in all the faith traditions, love your enemies, said Jesus, Love the stranger, says Leviticus, alongside all the belligerent stuff. The stranger lives with you in your land. Do not molest him. You must treat him as one of your own people and love him as yourself, for you were strangers in Egypt. We should remember that today when we look at the migrant problem. Amen. I'm glad the journey has brought you to us today. It's been a great pleasure to meet you and talk to you. Fields of Blood, Religion and the History of Violence, Karen Armstrong. Great to have you at TVO tonight. Thank you very much. And that is the agenda for Tuesday, December 15th, 2015. Tomorrow, it doesn't have to be like the War of the Roses. A new approach to divorce is helping people end relationships amicably. And we'll explore what that looks like. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at TVO.org. And we'll see you again tomorrow. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.